Since debuting Vault 76 last year, in honor of America's tercentenary, Vault-Tec continues to expand with plans for well over 100 vaults around the country. And now our exclusive coverage of the continuing volatile situation with communist China. There once was a magical place called Vault 76. It protected the best and the brightest of the land from the ravages of the world above. While the surface was burned by nuclear fire and overrun with monsters of radiation and mutation, the people of the vault lived safe and secure, preparing for the day when they would emerge into the new world. Before the plague, before Reclamation Day, and before our residents would become the heroes and villains of a much larger story, it was their time in the vault that helped shape their destiny. As the night draws near, grab a warm glass of milk and a fancy lad snack cake and sit back as we present Bedtime Stories, Tales from Vault 76. <laughs> Once upon a time, many years ago, in a very special place called Vault 76, there lived a young girl named Valeria. While the other children in the vault spent their days learning the skills to help rebuild the world after Reclamation Day, she was preparing for a much different role in the new world. The woman who would become known as the Colonel, and her journey that would end at the White Spring, started in Vault 76. Every villain is the hero of their own story, and this is hers. It was 22.30 on a Friday night, and Albert Faustina was where he normally was this time of night, sitting at his kitchen table, writing up his weekly report. He'd lost track of the number of small notebooks he'd filled since the day the vault door closed, back on October 23rd, 2077. But it was all part of his assignment. Monitor the loyalty of the Vault 76 residents and report back to the White Spring after Reclamation Day. When he and his wife Beatrice weren't performing their cover duties with the other residents, they were spending most of the rest of their time training their daughter. Before the war, neither he nor his wife seriously talked about having kids. Their work at Sugar Grove didn't lend itself to family life. But, when Beatrice found out she was expecting here in the vault, well, their perspective changed. That didn't mean they'd gone soft. Once their daughter had been old enough, they had started training her to follow in their footsteps. The world above was going to be dangerous, and ordinarily that would have been enough. But being government operatives, both Beatrice and Albert had bigger plans for their daughter. He was just finishing up when he felt that familiar itch between his shoulder blades. Albert didn't even need to turn around. Can't sleep, Val. Young Valeria Faustina gave a little scowl. She tried to be as quiet as possible and sneak up on her father, but he always seemed to be able to sense when she was coming. No, sir. Valeria never referred to her parents as mom or dad, or even by their names. It was always sir or ma'am. Albert turned around in his chair. His daughter, now officially a teenager having turned 13 the month before, was standing in the doorway, dressed in her standard vault tech pajamas. Are you nervous? A little, sir. <laughs> Well, tomorrow is a big day. Your mother has been looking forward to taking over your combat training for a while now. She's been very impressed with your skills and wants to help you refine them. Now, well, and honestly, there isn't anything else I can teach you. Albert had started training Valeria in hand-to-hand -hand combat when she turned eight. He and his wife agreed that their daughter needed to learn all the basics before Beatrice would take over. Albert didn't consider himself half bad, but his wife had been the last human hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor at Camp McClintock before her transfer to Sugar Grove. Why don't you come over here? 
I'll get you a glass of milk, and uh, I might have something special, too. Albert patted the chair next to him and walked over to the refrigerator. Valeria padded over to the table and slid into the chair while her father poured a large glass of milk and brought it over, placing it in front of his daughter, along with a small plate of fancy lad snack cakes. Valeria looked at the plate and then up to her father with a surprised look. Shh, don't tell your mother. I know they're your favorite, and I sneaked some out of the commissary this morning. A lot of people would have expected that a veteran military man like Albert would have been disappointed to have a daughter instead of a son, but the thought never crossed his mind. Valeria was everything he could have wanted and so much more. She was smart, very smart, and she took to their training like she was born for it. More importantly, Valeria never hesitated, never backed down. Your mother isn't going to go easy on you. Remember those first few matches with me? I do, sir. When you broke my wrist. And what did you learn from that? I didn't pay enough attention to the position of your feet, sir. That's right. But you learned. And you returned the favor, didn't you? Valeria nodded. Another child might have thought how unfair it was to put an eight-year-old against a fully grown man. But instead, she had taken every punch, kick and fall in stride. Every bruise was one as a reminder to do better, learn and not make the same mistake twice. And she had gotten much better. And finally, it had been her father nursing his own bruises and a broken wrist of his own. It's going to be hard. Harder than it's ever been. You're old enough now. And, uh, your mother isn't going to pull her punches, so I understand how you feel. But it's necessary. Every time you lose here is the chance to do better. Because out there, in Appalachia, losing a fight can get you killed. For Valeria, it was the same life lesson her parents had drilled into her for as long as she could remember. The world was a cruel place, even before the war. And their mission, what they needed to accomplish, required the will to do whatever it takes. And the ends would always justify the means. But that didn't change the fact that she was nervous. The last thing she wanted to do was to disappoint her mother. That's why she'd been pushing her father harder than ever in their fights over the past year. Valeria took a drink of milk and set the glass down on the table before taking one of the snack cakes and biting into it. She relished every bite. Once she had finished, she looked back up at her father. Sir... Can you tell me a story? Something to take my mind off of tomorrow. Please, sir? Sure, Val. What would you like to hear? Can you tell me what you and ma'am were doing at Sugar Grove? Sugar Grove was the DIA facility where they had worked before the war. Albert enjoyed telling Valeria stories of the old days. The war, the agitators in Appalachia, and some of the missions they'd undertaken to protect America from the godless commies. But what he and Beatrice had done at the Grove, as the staff called it, well... Those stories had yet to be told. Valeria watched her father sit back in the chair and run his hand through his closely cropped hair. Well, I think you're old enough to understand. Let me tell you about the project your mother and I worked on. It was called Somnus. As Albert started his tale, Valeria rested her hands under her chin and listened with rapt attention. She loved her father's stories and hung on every word. What does Somnus mean, sir? Somnus was the Roman god asleep, Val. But in this case, it was a secret project to combat the spread of communism in Appalachia. Albert started all the way back at the beginning, when he and his wife were recruited by the Enclave after Camp McClintock had been fully automated. At first, they expected to be reassigned to the Pentagon, but instead they were approached by a colonel from the DIA about a special project to help deal with the unrest overtaking Appalachia. Remember when we told you about all those communist agitators? Those pesky union workers who kept closing the mines and hindering the war effort? Well, we really needed to do something about them. And what better way than to turn those communists and criminals into our own agents? Now, your mother and I didn't acquire these people. We had other operatives to do that for us. Sir, what did you do with them then? There were these wonderful scientists. Patriotic Americans, each and every one of them. We had to purge these misguided individuals of their communist ideas using a very special process, including chemicals from Arctos Pharma. We created sleeper agents to help with the war. Now, not all of them worked out. Once the scientists were finished, it was my job to put them through their paces and give them their final certification for field use. And if they didn't pass, sir? Then it was your mother's job to take care of them. It was always going to be us or them, Val. And if this is what it took, of course, we did it. 
These people had betrayed their country. We were merely giving them a way to serve, whether they wanted to or not. <laughs> what have we always told you? The ends justify the means, sir. That's right. Your mother and I were very proud of what we did, and the results spoke for themselves. In fact, most of the time, these agents worked perfectly. They would be allowed to go back to their lives, but when we needed them, all it took was a signal from our facility, and they would return for their briefings. Valeria finished her milk and snack cakes, completely absorbed by her father's stories. While she didn't completely understand all the technical language, she was fascinated by it. It sounded all so exciting, and maybe after Reclamation Day, she'd be able to be as heroic as her parents were, too. My job was to monitor the agents during their mission. There were systems all over the region that allowed us to track telephone calls, radio transmissions, and even eavesdrop on regular conversations. Your mother was the field agent in charge. If things got messy, it was her job to clean things up, including the agent too, if they failed. I have to give the eggheads credit. They did their job really well. Too well in at least one case. What happened, sir? This one agent, a young kid, I didn't know his name, but he was TK-421 to us. The file said he'd been a mill worker and union organizer before we caught up to him, a real criminal to be sure. He had just eliminated a communist cell for us and stumbled on a black bear on his way back to the grove. He and the bear had words, apparently, along with a whole bunch else. By the time your mother got to his location, old TK-421 had killed that bear with his bare hands. Your mother followed the blood trail all the way back to base. See, old TK didn't stop. He followed his orders to a T. Bay found him, crawling right to our back door, missing an arm, and he was cut up pretty bad otherwise. So your mother did what she had to do and put him down. And that was the last mission for TK-421. Valeria's father continued to tell his stories, and Valeria put her head down on the kitchen table. She was finally tired, and before long, she had fallen fast asleep. And that was the first mission we ever sent a child agent on. Albert finished up and saw that Valeria had finally dozed off. He stretched and yawned, knowing that he'd need to be up early himself tomorrow. As quietly as he could, he picked up the glasses and plate, placing them into the sink. Walking back, he put his hand on his daughter's head. She murmured in her sleep, but didn't move. Albert smiled and carefully picked Valeria up, cradling her in his arms. She snuggled up against him, and he carried her back to her room. He gently tucked her back into bed, and as Albert was getting ready to leave, he stepped on something. Looking down, he saw that it was Valeria's old teddy bear. She had never played much with dolls. Her interests were more martial, but she loved her teddy. He picked it up and slipped it under her arm before leaning down and kissing her on her forehead. Love you, Val. Sleep tight. Albert smiled as he walked back to the kitchen, where he found his wife washing the dishes in the sink. Val couldn't sleep? Oh, she was just nervous about tomorrow. But she's ready. She better be. I'm not going to go easy on her. I told her as much. She understands, and she's a good kid. But be. Try not to break anything, at least on the first day. Okay, sweetie? We wouldn't want the overseer to start asking too many questions. Beatrice finished up and put the dishes on the drying rack before taking her husband in her arms. You know, going easy on her isn't going to help her. Not here and definitely not out there. I'm going to do what's best for our daughter. But I'll try not to put her in the infirmary. At least tomorrow. After that, no promises. That's all I ask. I love you, B, and I love Val. I just need to finish my report and then I'll go to bed. It'll be a big day for all of us and we need our sleep. Once upon a time, 27 years after the bombs fell, there were two people, 
a vault dweller and a California girl. They met and sparks flew. That's when things got interesting. Once Upon a Wasteland is their story. Follow Elizabeth Kirby and Odessa Valdez as they pursue their happily ever after in the post-apocalyptic Appalachian wasteland of Fallout 76. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and many other podcasting platforms. Once Upon a Wasteland, a Fallout 76 love story. Available now. Thank you again, members, for joining us here for a very special mini-series of The Modus Files, Bedtime Stories, Tales from Vault 76. If you've enjoyed this content, please subscribe, and better yet, please leave a review to help others find our little enclave. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Modus Files, for more information about our podcast, Fallout 76 content, and random musings on the enclave. I'd also like to thank our cast, Pandora Beatrix as young Valeria Faustina, Dr. Mark Harsworth as Albert Faustina, Mandy Marie B. as Beatrice Faustina, and introducing Wendy Novosinski as the Overseer. And a shout out to the Apocalyptic Aristocracy Discord, home to a great group of fellow creators, the Robots Radio podcast community, and the rest of the Robots Radio Rocket Club, and Jeremiah Johnson, our favorite character artist who provided the wonderful character artwork you can find on our website. Stay tuned for our next episode of The Modus Files, Episode 8, The Blood Eagle War, Part 1. Lastly, thank you to all of our subscribers and supporters. God bless the Enclave, and God bless America.